Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sabbath School Study Group, where our focus this week is honesty with God. Now, we are focusing on honesty with God in the light of what we're talking about in regards to stewardship, being faithful to what it is that God has given us. And the greatest gift that he has given us, obviously, is salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. And so as we think about honesty, we want to start off by seeing some of the, the overarching virtues of honesty, not just telling the truth in a moment, but the life of honesty or the life of faith. And so our focus verse for the week is taken from Luke chapter 8, 15, and the promise we want to claim and the prayer we have now, but that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Father, this is our prayer that we would bear fruit, but you're showing us now that one of the, the gateways to this life is honesty. So please, Lord, teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our big three for the week, or rather for today, looking at the life of honesty or the life of faith, the first principle that we want to understand is that honesty, according to Scripture, is a lifestyle, not just a moment. When you look at some of the honest patriarchs and matriarchs of Scripture, one of those that may jump out is Moses. Well, of Moses, it says in Numbers 12, my servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. Now, the Lord is using Moses to contrast someone who is not being faithful. But when the Lord describes him, he says that he's faithful in all his house. Now, this faithfulness is manifested in this verse in this way in Hebrews 3 where it says, and Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant. Talking about stewardship, Moses was faithful. And it was a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. So Moses's faithfulness was spoken of God. It's echoed here in Hebrews 3. But when you bring this together in in Romans chapter 4, and it talks about Abraham, We're not just looking at one instance when we're thinking of these individuals, but it's pointing to their lives because of Abram. It said in Romans four, the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of faith. The steps of that faith of our father, Abraham. So those who are faithful walk in the steps, knows the plural which he had being yet uncircumcised. He was walking in faith even while he was physically uncircumcised because spiritually he was trusting the father to fulfill his promise of a son. In the same way, honesty is a walk in the steps of truth. If you will, some people use the term blueprint. And when they're thinking about, you know, um, getting back to God and and doing the right thing, they they say, we got to follow the blueprint. And what I've come to find out is that the blueprint is really a footprint. The blueprint of what God would have us to be and and how he wants us to live is really identified in the footprints of Jesus. When we see how he walked and when we think of Jesus, we don't just think of one event. We think of a lifetime, even though in terms of the Gospels, excuse me, in terms of of um, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we're just really talking about three and a half years. But in that three and a half years that were clearly an echo of what he was doing in the previous 30 years. He was living a life. And that's why our lives reflect this truth, how honesty is a lifestyle. Now, if honesty is a lifestyle, what we've got to see is that honesty is not just what we say, but what we do, because it's not just a moment. And we speak a word in a second, but the honesty that the Lord is talking for and the honesty that the world needs, it carries over into all that we do. It's a lifestyle. And it's an action because Galatians 2.11 says in this story, when Paul is, is dealing with Peter and Peter now is not living consistent to what he is preaching, he rebukes him. He says, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Well, why is Paul rebuking Peter? Well, for being dishonest. Well, how was Peter dishonest? Well, let's read on. See, in verse 12, for before that certain came from James, Peter did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, that is some folks from Jerusalem, Jews, Peter withdrew and separated himself from the Gentiles, fearing them, fearing those Jews which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. And then so because Peter did it, other Jews decided to withdraw 
insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So Paul's like, whoa, 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 whoa. We're under a new covenant. Jesus has shown us that we not, not call any man unclean, but if anyone calls on the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ, not only are they saved, but that person is my brother, that person's my sister. And so Paul is rebuking him. And he says in verse 14, when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, in other words, when they were not being honest with themselves and with these brothers, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles and not do as the Jews, why compellest thou then the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? He was rebuking him for dishonesty and he was living a life contradictory to what he claimed to believe. And so that lets us know and it implies to us that honesty is not just saying honesty is seeing. It is living what I claim to believe. So now when we see the third principle in, in honesty, in the life of honesty, this type of honesty with others starts with honesty to our father. See, Paul was able to live this way, Moses, Abraham, because their lives, they saw themselves as living their lives in the presence of God and in the attendance of others. They were not living for people in the in the in the uh, in the presence of God. No, no, no. They lived in the presence of God. And that mindset with him as being prime, it carried over to how they treated others. Let's look at some scriptures here because Hebrews six, it says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection. Now, in other words, those who who are trying to walk again in the blueprint and the footprint of Jesus. We're not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. In other words, doing those things that Jesus has taken out of our lives, going back to them. No, instead, we're living in faith. But look here, faith toward God. It's the attitude of doing what I do because God is watching me. In other words, God is with me. In fact, by his spirit, God is in me. We see it in the lives of the patriarchs in 1 Kings 17, Elijah the Tishbite man of God who was of the inhabitants of Gilead said to wicked King Ahab as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand I live in his presence and I know his word and I know his will therefore there shall not be dew nor rain these years but according to my word see Elijah was able to pray this prayer because he knew the word of God which said if Israel was living in disobedience the Lord would withhold the rain from them and because of this, he was confident that the Lord would hear his prayer because he was standing before the Lord. And God answered and honored his word and Elijah's prayer. It even carried on to the one who followed him, Elisha, the prophet of God, who healed Naaman by the power and the word of God. Naaman was so excited, he returned to the man of God and he and all his company. And he came and stood before Elisha and said, behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Let me pay you for what you've done. And Elisha was honest. And he said, as the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And even though Naaman urged him to take it, he refused. He was able to refuse Naaman because he was he was living with his God. He was able to reject Naaman's offer because he had chosen to receive God's grace. And because of this, living in the presence of God, living before him, he was able to be honest, even in a world of dishonesty. In the same way now, that's how we want to live. We want to live in the presence of God, recognizing that honesty is not an act. It's not something we turn on or we turn off. It's something that we do because it's who we are. And it's who we are because we choose to now live a life in the light of God's glory and knowing that he sees everything that I am and everything that I'm not. While that may seem like a harsh truth to some, in reality, it's a beautiful gift, because when I realize my limitations, it's only then that I'm willing to surrender myself to God's limitless, to God's awesomeness, to God's omnipotence. Living a life of honesty allows us then now in connection with this omnipotence to be like those that were on the good ground 
and which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it like Moses, like Abram, like Elijah, like Elisha. And because of this honesty, we're able to bring forth fruit with patience.